Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, what we're going to do today is talk about combinatorics. Did anybody bring in any questions before we get started? Okay? All right. So, what I've got up here, can everybody read this perfectly well? I don't care because I don't want you to. Okay? Mm -hmm. What we have up there, those are 25 digit numbers, and there are 90 of them in that set of numbers. We're going to come up with methodologies to prove that two subsets of those 90 numbers must have the same sum. We added them up. Now that's overwhelming, isn't it? How in the world can you do that? Well, these types of tools, combinatorics just means counting, by the way. So combinatorics are a set of tools that come out of statistics and other places that you will run into needing when you are programming. So what I want to do is through this series is introduce you to several different ways of thinking so that you know they exist. All right? We will have a quiz on it and they will be on the final, but of course it's open book so you can go find what you need to find, right? But by doing the exercise of doing that, later, if you run into this type of problem, you're going to say, oh, wait a minute, I know where to go to figure out how to solve this kind of problem. All right? Does that make sense? Okay. So, with that said, we're going to turn this off. Because we don't want to do that now. But you will, before this is over, know how to do that. <coughs> What if we had this problem? We've got a donut store. And in this donut store, we have five different types of donuts. So maybe we have sugar donuts, uh, chocolate, iced donuts, uh, double chocolate donuts. Uh, let's see. Um, plain. Plain, good. Got to have plain donuts, right? One, two, three, four, each one more, let's say, uh, filled donuts, okay? Custard filled. All right. How many different ways can I make a dozen donuts out of those five different varieties? Hmm. Well, that's a problem. So what we do with combinatorics is we take problems like this, and then we find other uh, numerical examples that we can map these problems into. For instance, uh, if I were to find out how many students there are in the room today, what would I do? Count. What would I count? Each student. Heads, right? Okay. So I'm assuming that every student has one head. Right? What if I were underneath a glass floor and I was trying to count how many people there were? I might count feet, right? But then I divide by two. Okay? So those are real simple examples of what we do. We take a situation where we're trying to figure out how to count something and we map it into a counting method. All right? So we do the same thing here. What if we were to do this? Let's say that I'm going to make a dozen donuts. And I'm going to use two sugar donuts, so I put two zeros to represent two sugar donuts, and maybe four chocolate ice donuts, and let's take three pure chocolate, so that's two, six, nine. Let's take one plain, so that's ten, and two filled donuts. So do I have twelve there? Two, six, nine, ten, twelve. Okay. Now, that's a good start, isn't it? But now I got to figure out if I'm going to figure this out as a number. I need something to separate the zeros from sugar donuts to chocolate flakes. Because if I just listed zeros, you wouldn't know which was which. So let's put a one in here to show the boundary between the different types of donuts. So now what do I have? I have a binary number, don't I? Okay. How many binary numbers can I have with exactly one, two, three, four ones in it? That would be the answer, wouldn't it? The number of binary numbers 
by the way, that's 16 digits long now because I had four ones. How many 16 digit binary numbers are there with exactly four ones? That would tell me how many ways I can make a dozen donuts out of five varieties. Interesting, isn't it? Okay. That's the kind of thing we're talking about today. And I'm going to show you that eventually. So we're talking about counting one thing by counting something else. We're counting donuts by counting binary numbers. Okay. A lot of this we've talked about, so I'm going to move ahead. So there are two basic rules that we're going to look at. One is called the sum rule, and the other is called the product rule for counting. Okay? So let's look at a sum rule. Everybody knows about Linus and Susie in the uh, Peanuts characters, right? Or Lucy, I'm sorry. Uh, let's say that Linus tells Lucy that she's going to, he's going to give her or allow her 20 crabby days and 40 arable days and 60 surly days. But she can't be both in the same day. All right. So how many days has he allowed her? Well, when you just add these up, that's 20, 60, and 60 is 120 days. That's the sum rule. Because they're all different, they're not related. Well, let's see. What about the product rule? Where would we have a situation the product rule? Well, we talked about uh, taking sets and taking the cross product of sets and we were talking about sets. What does that mean? Well, that means is you take the first element from this set, the second element from this set, the third from this, the fourth from that. That's how you take a cross product of sets. How many ways can you do that? Well, you take the cardinal number of elements in P1 times the number of elements in P2 times <coughs> the number of elements in P3 times the number of elements in P4. But what's an example of that? Well, let's see. Let's say that I'm coming up with a, um, a password rule and we're going to make our rule that you must start with a letter and that can be upper or lower case. And it must be followed by um, uh, six to eight numeric characters. Okay? So for instance, this would be an example of it. Okay? It's got to have eight. Uh, six or eight. Uh, this would also be an example of it. And this would be an example of it. Right? And lots more because I can use whatever letter and whatever letter I want. How many ways can I pick this first character? 26. How many? 26. It sounds like 26, right? But, yeah. Don't we have to consider upper and lower? Yeah. Did I say capital? Yeah, upper or lower. So, it's 52. Now notice that that's like P1, isn't it? P1 is the set of all uh, alphabetic characters, upper and lower case. P2, though, 
comes from the digits, right? The magic digits. How many are there? Ten, because we count zero. Okay. And we can repeat. One, two, three, four, five, six, at least in the character in the first case where it's six characters, six numerics. Okay. So we can rewrite this as 52 times 10 to the sixth power, can we? But can't we also have a alpha followed by seven numerics? Because we can have six to eight. So that's another possible password uh, pattern, isn't it? So we would take 52 times 10 to the seventh, and then we have a whole bunch more, 52 times 10 to the eighth. How would we handle accumulating all of that? Would it be a product, or would it be a sum? It's a sum, isn't it? Yeah, you take all of the numbers because they're disjoint. They're not connected in any way. That's a whole new set. So we would take 52 times 10 to the 6th plus 52 times 10 to the 7th plus 52 times 10 to the 8th. So what we've done is we've used both the product rule and the sum rule. Do I see that okay? It's kind of obvious once we see it, but when we're going through it for the first time, it may not be. Okay. So that's the concept of the sum rule and the product rule, using passwords. So here's the question. I'm in a dark room, early morning, winter, right? The electricity's gone out. But <clears throat> I've got to get dressed to go to work. So I go to my dresser, and I open the top drawer where I keep my socks. And I know that in there, I've got red socks, green socks, and yellow socks. But I can't see them. How many socks do I have to pull out of that drawer? Oh, let's say that there are 26 socks in there. We don't have any. We've got pairs anyway. There are 26 socks in there. How many socks do I need to pull out of that drawer to make sure that I have a pair? Two. Oh, oh, same color. <laughs> I've got, what did I say, green socks, yellow socks, and blue, blue socks. Okay. How many do I have to pull out of there to make sure I've got a pair? Four. Four. Exactly. Four. <laughs> so, how do we know there's four? Well, if I pull the first one out and it's yellow, and I pull the second one out and it's red, and I pull the third one out and it's green, what's the fourth one going to be? One of those three, isn't it? Ah. So that's where the pigeonhole idea comes from. The idea comes from this. When we had carrier pigeons, which is World War I, World War II, I think, when they started this. But anyway, they would have a coop with pigeonholes in it. And when they sent the pigeons out uh, to do their delivery of messages and they came back in, if they had 
pigeons in every hole, but two pigeons in one hole, they knew what? They had more pigeons than they sent out. Okay? Something had happened. So that's the pigeonhole principle. And you're going to find that it works in a number of different situations. That just happens to be one of them. So let's look at let's look at one of them. Uh, let's say that of all of the men in a particular city, we know that there are five hundred thousand men. <laughs> and further, that's five hundred thousand men who are not bald. This is why there's a man. Okay, uh, 500 men that are not bald. We also know that there are approximately, at most, 200,000 hairs on a man's head. That's how many they can have. Can I say that we know for sure that there are at least three men in that city with the same number of hairs on their head? We can say it, can I? But can I prove it? <laughs> so, let's say that I want to count the number of people that have hairs on their head and make sure that two of them or three of them have the same number. Well, what's the possibilities for numbers of hairs? Well, I can have one person, one man with one hair, I can have another man with two hairs, another man with three hairs, another man with four hairs, all the way up to 200,000 hairs, right? What happens when I pick the next man? I've got one of each of those men with those numbers of hairs on their head. What happens when I pick the 200,000th and first man? Doesn't he have to have the same number of hairs as one of those? Yeah. It's like the socks in the drawer, isn't it? Okay. Now let's say that I continue on, and just by chance, I happen to duplicate all those. Now I've picked how many men? 400,000, right? And each of them, they can be paired up as to the numbers of hairs on their head. What happens when I pick the 401st? They're going to have, that be the third person with the same number of hairs as someone else. We don't know who, and we don't know how many hairs that person's going to have, those three people are going to have. But we do know that there are at least three people out of those 500,000 with the same number of hairs on their head. Everybody with me on that? Okay. So what problem does that also help us solve? Well, what about those numbers I put up at the beginning? 25 digit numbers. There are 90 of them. And I want to show that if you take subsets of those, at least two subsets will have the same sum. Well, first of all, get my numbers here to make sure I get the right numbers. Um, how many subsets are there of 90? Well, we talked about this in sets, didn't we? Remember that if I have a three character set, remember how many subsets of that there are? Well, let's see. I've got um, the empty set, right? And that's a subset of everything. And then I've got the set containing one, set containing two, the set containing, whoops, not one, two, and three, because I need to say these characters I gave it. A, B, C, 
Now I have AB, don't I? Do I have AC? Do I have BC? <coughs> and the set itself is always a subset of itself. Okay? How many do I have here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And what was our rule? Anybody remember? So, to the end. To the, to the end, exactly. So when you have three elements of a set, then you have two to the end subsets. And two to the third is eight. So we had 90 of these 25 digit numbers, didn't we? So how many subsets are there? Two to the 90th power. Um, which means that if each one of those has a different sum, that's going to be greater than or equal to 1.287 times 10 to the 27th. Now, what's the largest sum that we could ever have? Well, isn't it the whole thing? All 25? Okay. So, we would take the largest sum would be 90 times uh, 10 to the 25th power, just like on the uh, password thing we have there. There are 10 digits, but there are 25 of them. Okay? Um, and then plus one. Why would I add one? It doesn't make any difference. What about zero? Okay, it's a possibility of zero. Okay, so anyway, that is less than or equal to 0 0.901 times 10 to the 27th. Oh, wait a minute. So the number of sums I can get is less than the number of subsets I can get. Right? The number of colors of socks is less than the four socks that I pull, right? So therefore, at least two sets must have the same sum. Complicated problem, which came down to a fairly easy calculation. Right. Can that be useful? Well, yeah. What if you were working for Google and you had to come up with a methodology for passwords and you wanted to make sure that nobody, that no, nobody had the duplicate password? Hmm. What would you do? How about taking all the people in the world and then come up with a pattern which is greater than or equal to that? That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. okay. defective dollars and the a defective dollar is one where the eight digit serial number has some digit that repeats okay so if some digit repeats we're going to say that's a defective dollar it isn't for real but we're going to say it is okay so What's the likelihood of finding a, uh, a defective dollar? Or another way of looking at it is, what's the likelihood of finding a non-defective dollar? Well, 
wouldn't we take all of the possible pa uh, serial numbers and divide it by the number of defective dollars, right? So what are all of the possible when you would say um, it's going to be 10 to the 8th power would be the number of possibles, right? Now what about the number of defective dollars? Or not even, it's a good number of non-defective. Yeah, number of non-defective dollars are going to be those where they're different. So we could say the first digit is 10, 10 choices, but once we've taken that first digit, how many choices do I have for the second digit? Nine. And the third one? And the fourth one? And the fifth one? Nine, eight, seven, six, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight, right? Okay. And we find out that that is. One million eight hundred and fourteen thousand different combinations that we can come up with for uh, defective dollars. And if we take it out of the total number, which is ten to the eight. It turns out that's 1.8144. One Gee, only 1.844% are non-defective. Or in other words, 98.9% .9 are defective. <laughs> okay. So, chessboard chessboard, eight squares across, and let's say that I've got a king, um, a bishop, and a pawn. But the rule is that they must not be in, there must not be two in the same column or two in the same row. How many different ways can I arrange those? Well, I can look at this. If I take the king, then uh, the king can have eight different, let's look at king's rows, eight different rows, um, and how about how many columns the king can have? Can he have eight different columns? Mm -hmm. But once you've chosen that, how many rows can the bishop be in? Only seven, because that's what's left, isn't it? And how about the columns? Seven. Well, then we get to the pawn. How many rows can the pawn be in? Six. Six, because we've taken one for the king and one for the bishop. There are only six left, and the columns would be six. So if we wanted to look at the number of different patterns here, we would say, well, of the rows, it's eight times 7 times 6, but also we need to then say for each one of those, there's 8 times 7 times 6 columns. 
So you would take 8 times 7 times 6 times 8 times 7 times 6. And that would be the number of patterns that you could have for a bishop, a bishop, uh, a king, a bishop, and a pawn on the same chessboard where neither one can, we can't have two sharing either rows or columns. Okay? Is everybody okay with that? Well, let's look at it a little differently. Say instead of king, bishop, and pawn, we have two pawns. Now what's going to happen? Well, pawn one can have how many positions, how many different rows? Eight. Eight. And pawn two? Oh, let's say no, pawn one columns could have eight, right? So pawn two's rows can be seven, and pawn two's columns can be seven, right? Mm -hmm. So we would say eight times seven times eight times seven, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Now that says that it's the same problem as the previous one. But let me ask you, if this is pawn one and this is pawn two, is that a different pattern from putting pawn two down, one down there, and putting pawn two up there? No. 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 Same pattern, right? Yes. Whoa. So what does that mean? For every pattern we came up with, we've got to divide by two, right? Because there's really two patterns that are the same. So it's just thinking these things through. Could you settle the same thing for the last one, except for we divided by, uh, you could do three different combinations between them, right? Well, I'm sorry? Couldn't you say the same thing for the last one we did, where it was three, uh, the king? Oh, no, because they would be different, different, wouldn't they? Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Good point. Yes. So if they're different, it's different than if they're yeah. the same, right? In this case. Okay. This is, by the way, something you already know if you've never seen it probably in this presentation. But we're going to get there. Here's an interesting one. <laughs> Let's say that um, at a school I have uh, 20 math majors, 30 uh, computer science majors, and 10 engineering majors. Okay? Now, they are all in their senior year and they're getting ready to graduate. So I want to figure out how many graduates I'm going to have. Well, let's see, that's fairly easy, isn't it? Uh, 20 plus 30 plus 10 is that the number? Question? Ah, what is it? What about double majors? Yeah. What about a student who majored in math and computer science? Haven't I counted that student twice? Oh. So maybe what I really need to do is use different notations here. So let's use M for math, and that's cardinal number, right? So it's number of math students plus the cardinal number for CS plus the cardinal number for engineering. Now I want to subtract out the cardinal number for math uh, intersect CS, right? Let's use C instead of CS. Okay. Do I also want to subtract out the number of double majors who are CS and engineering? And what about the 
number of math and engineering. Okay. So is that going to do it? What about triple majors? They're usually just going to die out because they're too much school. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I need to add those in back in again. <laughs> so that's math plus C plus. Okay. Okay. So that is a pattern that um, that needs to be um, looked at many times when you have intersecting sets and you're trying to figure out how many combinations there are when you have intersections, or, or how many the total cardinal number is. Okay. Take the letters in bookkeeper. How many ways can I rearrange the letters in bookkeeper and come up with a different sequence of letters? Not necessarily a word that means anything, but sequence of letters. Well, first of all, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten letters in bookkeeper. So you would say, gee, well, if I just took 10 factorial, that may be one way because once you've taken one of the letters out, now you have nine left, take that one out, you have eight left, take that one out, you've got seven left, right? But that won't matter if there's duplicate letters, right? Yeah, like the two pawns, right? Mm -hmm. Ah, good point. So I need to then divide by the fact that there are two zeros. Is that going to do it? No, because I also have two K's, don't I? Three K's. And I have three E's. What am I going to do with the three E's? Three factorial. Okay. By the way, the reason I put two and not two factorial is what? What is two factorial? Two times one. Two. Yeah, two times one, because one is the only letter. Number left. And two, one is the identity. <laughs> okay, so. This is the number now of different ways I can rearrange the letters in bookkeeper. Well, where does that come up? Um, remember this one? I'm not exactly sure what I had here. Result of a formula that we probably have all seen before. 
remember the concept of permutations and combinations? Okay. The equation for permutations is you take the total number, factorial, divided by the number you're choosing, factorial. And for combinations, you take n factorial over c factorial and minus c factorial. Okay. Now what's the difference? This is where order matters, and this is where order does not matter. Well, let's see. This was combinations, wasn't it? Because does, does it matter whether these two zeros get switched or not? Or whether these ones get switched or not? So the, this one was, a comp, was a, uh, an example of combinations. Are there more combinations or more permutations? Permutations are where order matters. So therefore, this would be different from when I switched the ones around. Oh, wouldn't make any difference, but the permutations would be if it made a difference. Notice that when you add something to a denominator, what happens to the value of an entity? It gets smaller, doesn't it? So, I don't know about you, but I always have a problem. I have to think carefully as I'm writing these things, okay? Because I get the two big stuff. But the fact of the matter is, there are fewer combinations and more permutations. Because for each combination, you can switch the numbers in the order, and that changes it to another permutation. Okay. So permutations, there are more of them than combinations. And when you look at these two, this is a bigger number than this one, because of the c and c factor of the denominator. Okay. So that's just one way to remember those two. Where do these things come up? Well, to give you a couple of examples from the, um, from the quiz, let's say that I have um, 35 students in a club, and I need to pick a slate of potential officers for the club. Now, there are five officers in the club. That's interesting. Unless it goes off again, we'll, we'll ignore it for now. So there are 35 students in this club, and I need to pick a slate of students to run for office. Now, when I pick a slate, I have not yet chosen which one's president, which one's vice president. It just says of these five, we're going to vote on who's in what position, right? So is that a combination or a permutation? Combination. It's combination because it doesn't matter how I list their names, does it? Okay. So so how many possible slates are there? Well, we start off with the total, which is 35. And if we're doing combinations, I should have written this down here so it's a little clearer. We want to then take C, which is the number in each slate, so that's 5 factorial, times N minus C. Well, 35 minus 5 is 30. Or we could say this is 35 times 34 times 33 times 32 times 31 times 30 on down over 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. And I don't have to put the 1 in there because that doesn't change the value of the multiply by 1. Times 30 times 29 times 28 times 27 all down. And the reason I do that is because those two cancel, don't they? 
So if I'm going to do this without having the factorial tool on my calculator, I could just multiply 35 times 34 times 33 times 32 times 31 and divide by 5 times 4 times 3 times 2. Okay? Everybody see that? Okay. Now that would be the number of combinations. Well, instead of picking a slate, let's say that I want five officers. How many different ways can I have five officers? Well, now it depends which one is the president and secretary and the vice presidents and so forth. So, I would say there are 35 factorial divided by 30 factorial. That's the easier equation, which is 35 times 34 33 times 32 times 31. Now, does everybody in here have a TI 84 or above? I do. No, I mean, but yes, you have. Anybody that does not, I guess, is the question. Own one or have one on us? You have what? Own one or have it on us now? No, no, not on you now, but just oh. own one. Have access to one. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Because if you look in the uh, math key on your 84, and by the way, depending on the generation of TI-84s, one of them is a single key for math and another is second in something for math, if I remember right. Yeah. But at any rate, under that key, you will find factorial. It's a tool. So the laser do these problems. Okay. So, oh, here's another one. Let's do this one. Um, how many different poker hands can you get out of a deck of 52 cards? Well, is that a combination or a permutation? It's a combination, isn't it? Because it doesn't matter how they're dealt to you. You may rearrange them in your hand. But how they're dealt to you doesn't make any difference, does it? Okay. So, let's see. Does that mean that, that that's 52 taken five at a time? Combinations. Is that many, how many poker hands you could have? Yeah. yeah. That's how many poker hands you could have. How many bridge hands can you have? Well, in bridge, you deal out 13 cards, so the whole deck gets, gets dealt out. Right? So, how many bridge hands could you have? Well, let's see. That would be 52 factorial over 13 factorial times 52 minus 13. So which one's going to be more? Are there more poker hands or more bridge hands? Poker hands. Both poker hands. hands. Try it. Try it. I won't tell you which one, but I want you to try it. Somehow it feels like there's more poker hands, doesn't it? But I bet you said that because it feels like it. an interesting problem. Okay. Now, this was kind of a fire hose approach to this stuff. So what I recommend is that you go over the readings. This all came from um, the first, the second, I think it's the second, the alternative. This is another set of readings. Uh, in this module, there are three different uh, links there. One is for counting one, counting two, and counting three, or what the chapters are called. That's where I took this from. Okay, the other book discusses pretty much the same subjects, but maybe a little bit before.
and then make sure that you take the quiz. Right? There's a quiz up. Has anybody tried the quiz? Okay, this is probably one that you really want to see the lecture before you try the quiz. And probably all I've done is kind of given you an idea that the answers are in there, but I'm not sure I understood everything today, right? This is a lot of stuff. Not a lot of stuff in the sense of each one being tough, but they're all different. Okay? They're all just counting methods. So what is it we're really trying to do today? What I was really trying to do today is introduce you to the fact that there are a number of different ways of counting things. And there are methodologies for it. And they're available either with Google five years from now when you're in your job and you're trying to find out something, or uh, this material for today. Now, there's one last thing I want to share with you because it's on the quiz, and it comes out of statistics. And it's how insurance companies predict the cost of something. So let's say that uh, there is an operation that uh, a lot of people have to have. And your likelihood of needing that operation in a 20-year period has a percentage to it, doesn't it? Likelihood. Okay. Now, if this operation were to cost $200,000, obviously the insurance company would want to know that, wouldn't they? If your likelihood of needing it in 20 years is 15%, what is the uh, insurance company's likelihood of our uh, statistical cost of that operation in 20 years? It's 15% of 200,000. Because they're looking at it over a population of people that are buying their insurance. So only 15% of the people will need that operation. You take the number of people times 15% times the across the operation, and that's how much the insurance company needs to allow for that operation statistically. Okay? Now, is that what they charge? No. No. Why? Because if they broke even, they wouldn't make any money. That's right. And if insurance companies don't make any money, who else doesn't make any money? Hmm? No, the hospitals get paid for the operation, but you. How many here have a 401k or will someday? Okay. I think it's important to understand this because we have these politicians that go around saying, "Oh, these rich companies," and people don't realize that the owners, the investors in those companies, are everybody's uh, retirement plans. Is the biggest investor in these companies. So don't always think about evil companies. Some companies are evil, there's no doubt about it. But don't just blanket assume all companies are evil. Okay? That's my political science statement for today. Okay? <laughs> uh, but at any rate, what you would do here is you would take 15% of 200,000, which uh, I think is, what, 30,000? That's the statistical cost. All right. Now, if you were comparing that with the cost of insurance over the 20-year period, and you were paying $20 a month, that'd be 20 times 12. I shouldn't use 20. Let's say you're paying $15 a month. 15 times 12 times 20 years, right? That would be the cost you were paying over that amount of time. And let's see, what is that? Well, 15 times 20 is 300 times 12, which is $3,600. $3, well, you didn't pay for the insurance, did you? That one didn't come out right. So that one would be a great deal. I would love to have the insurance, right? Okay. But anyway, that's how you figure these things out. And that's a problem on the quiz. So I wanted to make you prepared for that type of problem. Okay. Any other questions or inputs for today? All right. So, like I said, I went over that kind of fast. 
but I hope you leave here saying, wait a minute, those tools are in there somewhere for figuring all this out. And if you look at the uh, readings for counting one, counting two, counting three, that's what I was using here. And it's fairly easy, uh, if you print it out again, to leaf through every one of these readings, because they're really written for math, have proofs. And the reason we brought this course from the math department into the computing, the College of Computing, was because we need to understand proofs, but not on everything. I want you to understand how they work for computing. Okay, this is a good one because there's a lot of examples here that we may one day need to program for, right? Uh, next week, we're going to start looking at proofs. That's the, the next uh, module. And then the last module, by the way. Wow, so we're ending up the course kind of early, aren't we? Well, on purpose. What I'd like to do is, as much as possible, finish the course before Thanksgiving. And the reason is, we only have like one week after Thanksgiving before finals. And uh, although I hope this is your most important class, I do understand you have other classes. So if we can get the material covered and the final taken before Thanksgiving, that means after Thanksgiving, all you have to do is worry about your other classes. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, I want to take the first two weeks in November, hopefully, for review for the final. So two things you need to be doing. One is, I will have a quiz on proofs, but I haven't put it in there yet. So if you look at future quizzes, it's not there. But there will be one. Um, and we'll cover that next week. But two, uh, two things you need to be worried about right now. Make sure you're getting your project done for the end of this month. Remember, it's due on the end of October. And number two, be thinking ahead of all these modules. Are there any that you feel weakest on? Because those are the ones you want to ask questions on those. Uh, I think we'll have two Fridays before Thanksgiving. I hope so. Okay? Now, the other thing is, the final will probably be up for that second Friday, if there are only two. If there are three, then we'll get something else. But um, I want to have one Friday where you have already looked at the final and tried to answer as many as you can to find out where you still need help to successfully end this course. Because the idea here, remember, is knowledge, not grade. Grade is going to follow. But the trick is to always be ahead of the, of the, of the game so you know where your knowledge is weakest so you can ask, ask questions in class and I can help you. All right? That makes sense? Mm -hmm. okay. So any last questions? Are you going to post that today? The video? I'm going to try to. Um, it's interesting, it takes a couple of hours anyway just to process the video and to get it up. Um, and then it takes YouTube a while to process once it's sent up to YouTube. But I will start it as soon as I get home. Yeah, you probably do need this one, don't you? Okay. Yeah. Has, have people, have y'all been watching the other videos I did? Yes. Um, here's a question I've got for you. I'm going to have to edit some of this stuff off the end here. Um, I went to a conference a couple weeks ago, remember, when we didn't have class. And one of the questions that came up, it's amazing now how many people are looking at doing video lectures, okay, which I'm glad to hear. But uh, students' retention or being able to watch a video seems to run out if it's much more than 15 or 20 minutes. Do you all find that? I know I find it personally, by the way, so I'm with you. Uh, so the only problem I've got with doing these lectures in class is they tend to be an hour, right? So I'm going to put them up there, but here's what I recommend. As you're watching the video, remember I'm not watching you watch the video, so don't feel bad about fast-forwarding or saying, okay, I got that, right? Uh, use it as like you would a textbook. Flip back and forth. Um, some people, one of my teachers, uh, in order to make the lecture, the video lectures more interesting uh, on YouTube in the uh, descriptions part of it. They added uh, time keys of where you start each individual like, part of like lecture like when you're covering certain things like if you were covering 
the yeah. pigeonhole principles, and you can quickly just skip to this time and we can cover that material. Okay. That's an interesting idea. Just more you work. just gave me more homework. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I like that. That's a good idea. Because that way, when you're looking for something as a reference tool, you may only need three, four minutes of it. Mm -hmm. And you yeah. found it. Yeah. And then some people just get discouraged looking for the moment. You're like, can't okay, skip oh. the video and they can't find it. Absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, I like that idea. Okay. Then if there's nothing else, we're done for today. You're done for today. <laughs>